Welcome and good morning to everybody who is joining the conference on racism, justice, <laughs> environment, second day. And because it's very early, maybe we repeat which room this is. Um, today we have the panel on waste, recycling, and racism. Home conference is organized by the Roman Studies Program. And we thank everybody who is joining today in room and online. Um, everybody, um, Roman students, Bartale, very much. Uh, good to have you here. Good to see you in this room. My name is Gilda Nentimon. I will lead you today as a chair of this panel, and my main job today is to watch the time. So before we introduce uh, our wonderful um, and brilliant uh, discussants uh, on this panel, maybe just for the structure so everybody knows how we will create this panel. Um, we start with the presentation of Four papers, each paper 15 minutes, meaning until 10 o'clock we have the presentation of the papers. After this, our discussant will react and reflect these presentations approximately 10 minutes. So meaning shortly after 10, 10, 10 approximately, we will collect questions from the audience who is directly here in the room and from the online audience. And after this, um, our panelists, and uh, maybe also if the discussant wants to, um, will respond to all questions. So this is the structure for our panel today. Um, and I'm really very happy and honored and thrilled to listen to the coming presentations. And <clears throat> our panelists today are Jakub Chabai from the Roma Environmental Sustainability and Development Initiative. He currently is a lecturer at the Institute for European Studies and International Relations at the Faculty of Social Sciences from Minios University. We have uh, Dr. Diana Popescu from the University of Edinburgh, where she is a senior teaching fellow in political theory. Um, with us today, welcome also to Nicola Benko from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, PhD in social sociology. Um, at the University of Sofia. Um, warmly welcoming also Daniel Skobla from the Slovak Academy of Sciences. He's senior researcher, Institute of Ethnology and Social Anthropology, and our discussant um, from the Central European University, Alexios Antipas. He's associate professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us with your brilliant presentations and papers. We're looking forward to start now with the first presentation. Uh, Mr. Jakub Chabai, if you're ready. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Wonderful. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, you prefer to stand here? Yeah, if yeah. that's okay. Or... It's okay. I mean, I think you are visible at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, big thank you to the organizer, organizers, first of all, for having us here today. And uh, uh, yesterday's discussion was very good, so I look forward to today's one as well. Um, uh, this I'm going to be speaking of the paper we have uh, submitted. It's, uh, I would say, Unusual. It's not classic academic paper. It's more like a, a field-based uh, reflection on the, some of the conceptual, methodological, analytical framings. In many ways, touching upon what have been kind of critically uh, discussed yesterday, and it's also based on an ongoing action research project at the uh, Lunig Nine. So it's a in many layers, work in progress still. Uh, but uh, essentially, we are discussing the marginalized Roma communities in the context of the green transition. And we are looking at the case study of energy poverty, in particular, the Lunig 9, which probably most of you are uh, familiar with. It's a, a city ward in uh, Košice, fully populated by Roma communities. Uh, I will touch upon a bit of the history and the context a bit more. And then we are going to look at the kind of the case or the discussion of alternative methodology and more interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, so uh, 
the kind of a starting point is the state of art and in uh, many ways what in our work what we are taking a critical approach to is this framing uh, which is dominant um, in uh, uh, in terms of the uh, environmental or energy justice or injustice approach or environmental racism um, uh, we see this we are not saying that this is a in any way wrong approach but we are saying that from the kind of methodological analytical perspective it kind of misses out certain points some of them were highlighted in terms of for example agency uh, most of the time the Roma communities are portrayed as victims only. It's not that they are not victims, but also it's missing out their community agency in a, in a, in a number of ways. Uh, it's also uh, not sufficiently, I mean, if you look at the, uh, on a very practical level, uh, when you talk to the policymakers, the, this, the kind of outputs often uh, are kind of focused on litigation so we were often approached about uh, like okay can you help us record this and then uh this should lead to a kind of a court case and litigation which is not again not wrong and not saying that this is not the case another uh, right way to do but then then you have a practical problem that if you have for example a, a relatively like decent municipality, it's not necessarily the fault of the municipality itself, and you might sue the municipality for actually trying to do something, and you can't really do sue a municipality and at the same time build their capacity. Sometimes these two approaches can go against each other. Uh, so th this, this is why we are uh, uh, kind of trying to uh, argue for a kind of more case-by-case, context-based approaches with uh, more kind of agency-based uh, frameworks, and uh, we are going to touch about more about the action-based uh, methodology, and uh, the participatory element is uh, particularly important. Uh, we are also kind of working in the wider context. I mean, with this not, not something to be uh, uh, that you need to be introduced too much, but there is the EU policy framework and this kind of green transformation processes, which are happening. Yeah, I mean, th this is a process which is happening whether, whether we like it or not. And the, for us, the question is whether the marginalized Roma communities and other vulnerable groups, groups are going to be part of this process or not. And we are saying that if you don't do it now and don't do it well, uh, then it's going to be lose-lose. If you do it well, it might be win-win. A -win. Uh, few of the policy frameworks, and I mean, you have the recovery and resilience plan programming period, and this is individual for in each country, but in a way, it's a similar type of time frame and also what has been kind of a what has been a big impetus for us was the rising utility prices as a result of the uh russian aggression and the war in war in ukraine uh also in more broadly i mean if you look at the scholarship on the energy <laughs> poverty not in the context of romani studies i mean the romani uh, uh, study scholars kind of are familiar with with each other, with with uh, each other. But if you look at the energy poverty uh, scholarship, there is not that much on the case of uh, marginalized Roma communities. So there is a limited scholarship, and also if you look at I don't know Atlas of Roma Communities uh, or the kind of the national strategy uh, for uh, uh, for uh, the, the the national strategy for Roma integration. I mean this has been updated uh, recently. But there is the environmental or in sustainable development components are very weak. Or the last Atlas of Roma community, Communities has mentioned environmental indicators for the very first time, and they are, I would argue, still under underdeveloped. So this is the context of uh, Lunik uh, Nine. It's a city ward which was essentially created uh, in at the end of 1960s, early 70s, uh, and uh, I mean, we were just discussing with Daniel what was the true history because it's kind of contested. Uh, uh, but uh, because there is a story that it was originally intended, intended by the kind of socialist Czechoslovakia for this, which is with the acronyms ABC, which was meant to be this army, security, and gypsies. Uh, this is now contested. 
and uh, what uh, what most of the people would say that it was predominantly. Uh, it's actually not not a. I mean, location wise, it's not a bad area. I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, you have the forest behind, so it might have been it might have been like a nice uh, nice neighborhood. Uh, but uh, so it was mostly uh, housing for workers in like enterprises and municipal housing. So it was all public public housing. And until 1990s, you even though you had majority of population was Roma, uh, you it wasn't like it wasn't fully it wasn't hundred percent. So only in the 1990s, the city of Košice had this kind of very much a segregationist policy where you where the non-Roma or the majority population who didn't want to live there anymore. And this was also in the wake of like economic transformation where many people are losing jobs. And if you think about who was the first one who were losing jobs, it was uh, most, in many cases, uh, Roma communities. So uh, the, the majority population do want to live out. And then from the Košice city and surroundings, they kind of moved out whom they labeled as kind of a socially problematic individuals who were again, uh, uh, this, this was essentially a Romani community. So the, the city of Kushita created a ghetto, essentially. Uh, and then it got worse and worse. Some of the houses were sanated because of they were in, uh, in a poor, such a poor state, they have to be put down. And uh, it created, which is called the Maslichkova settlement. So it's in, an illegal settlement uh, with uh, kind of informal houses of a few hundred people. So these people actually don't have a proper, they don't even live in these blocks of flats. It's essentially like this rural informal settlements, but in a in an urban uh, district. It's uh, roughly 6,000 people. Then uh, we have a lot of problem with statistics. So official, officially you would have only two, 300 people who are registered unemployed. But the real unemployment is 60-70% according to the mayor or field social workers estimates. Uh, the other thing we have encountered uh, was that uh, according to Atlas of Roma Communities, you have almost 90% uh, of access to utilities or only, uh, up to 100% of access to utilities. Yes, it's, it's the case because you have the cables, wires like plugged in from the old days up to here. But you have almost like close to the opposite, close to zero of the actual people using it and having the actual households. Uh, so you you have this a lot of the infrastructure there in place, but uh, people are not using it because they were cut off because often they were not paying or simply it uh, uh, it got damaged over the years. So so the the statistics or the data we have is very much uh, very much flawed. So what uh, we have uh, tried to do, and I mean, now we kind of use these fancy terms like action research and kind of a participatory co-design or whatever to kind of fit it in academia. But what we, uh, how the, this kind of project started as a collaboration between our, I mean, this is why we started this registered as a civic association, essentially. Uh, and uh, when we were approached by the Friends of the Earth, with uh, and started working with the municipality was uh, uh, when uh, in this kind of energy crisis. So they wanted uh, kind of uh, some uh, some short practical study from the context of Roma communities on energy poverty, uh, which uh, so it started with this kind of situational assessment, which uh, is as, in a, in many ways it's it's this we kind of identified. The different types of housing, like the Mastichkovo. We did a kind of institutional overview who owns and administers. So only minority of the houses are administered by the local municipality, which is like this one, this one, and this one. Uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, but majority is by the kind of upper municipal level, the city of Kosice. So there is often very little what the local municipality can do if it doesn't administer on oath. Uh, this is the informal Maslichkova settlement. And this is kind of an EU project, 12 families with all the access to utilities. We 
looked at all of them, what's the actual access, what has been implemented so far. So there was like a pilot, quite successful public-private partnership on the credit-based system of, for water and electricity. So now this, thanks to the, this partnership, the this kind of house has access to electricity and water 100%. So we, we we actually managed to map a bit bits on what was the actual situation given the flaws in the in the data. Then uh, we wanted to do uh, uh, something more practical. So uh, we did a pilot energy audit. So we brought in the auditors for that uh, for the actually this orangey uh, house or a block of flats which uh, did, uh, I don't know if people are familiar here with how the energy audit works, but it gives you kind of different uh, interventions. Uh, uh, and uh, so the basic, so there are basic functional ones there, and there is a economically optimal and ecologically optimal uh, uh, ones. So the basic ones so that you actually have the necessary infrastructure and a basic access to all the utilities. And then the economically and ecologically uh, optimal is like, okay, one is more cost effective and the other one is actually taking all the boxes for the kind of sustainable standards. Uh, and we did then the feasibility study for the municipality, given all the kind of public uh, schemes on uh, kind of low interest rate uh, loans uh, or uh, kind of uh, EU EU schemes on uh, green uh, green houses and like we basically went through all the public schemes and found out that there is no way this municipality can afford it, like uh, or or the 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 residents because uh, the loan schemes would require them to pay back quite sufficient amount of money and unless they have jobs then this this, this is no no way possible. And also the schemes that are available with the municipality could apply for often go uh, up to, now it increased, but when we were doing the study, they went up to 50% only. So we looked at the budget of the municipality and there is no way they, they would be able to pay for that. Uh, so we uh, we did include the exact numbers in, in this paper, but I mean, it's available online, uh, but essentially the, re the fully, oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, re refurbishment of this house would be more than the total budget of the municipality itself. So just to give you an, uh, an estimate. And the next step we are thinking of is kind of a business plan for the local municipal energy community enterprise. And uh, we agreed with the municipality to help them with kind of this strategic document, which is planned for economic and social development and the sustainability component. So what, where does it leave us? I mean, I was very good in planning uh, when it came to my presentation, but I try to sum it, sum it up very quickly. So we, what we propose is uh, kind of a reframing of this of this topic from a sustainable development or a livelihoods perspective. I understand this is very. I mean, in a way, it's a bias or in terms of what kind of disciplines I am coming from from development studies. But uh, I mean, if you even Google and look uh, look at the Google Scholar or is a web of science or the scholarship, you don't have much application of the sustainable livelihoods uh, approaches to the Roma community. So why not trying it? This is something which might be uh, complementary to this environmental and energy justice approaches. They are often more holistic, inter intersectional. Uh, they can't uh, con uh, like take into consideration local contextual complex uh, complexity and community individual household agency. We also propose borrowing analytical frameworks from institutional literature. I mean, I mentioned there Ostrom's institutional analysis and development framework, which was uh, used from a kind of a collect uh, collective action problem and uh, common pool resources management. Uh, I think it's a very practical tool, which can be very useful for the context we are de dealing with more co-design and co-creation, but essentially participatory action research methodologies where you help the local agents build capacity uh, for evidence-based policy making. Uh, and also the other thing is involving scholars. Yeah, yeah this is the last sentence. Uh, thank you. Uh, involving scholars from technical disciplines that we don't have the no uh, sufficient knowledge about. I and mean, we weren't able to do energy audit. I mean, I wouldn't feel competent about 
but this was essential for the next step in the project. So, uh, and this is also a problem with the civil society. Many of the Roma civil society organizations, they don't have experts in this field or a sufficient amount of experts. So why not bring in the kind of a technical expertise uh, in the in our scholarship and civil society and projects to kind of boost up what, what we can. So it's not only interdisciplinary in the social sciences, realm, but also across all, all disciplines. This is all for me uh, for today. And I would be happy to discuss any more, more points that I have missed out or didn't manage to cover. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Jakub Chabla, and for giving us this perfect example with Lumic 9 for um, showcasing the relations between uh, racism, justice, and environment. We can see very well. And I would like to invite our, our second presentation by uh, Dr. Diana Popescu, University of Edinburgh. Uh, are you ready, Ms. Popescu? Yes, yes, I'm ready. And Kian is a wonderful. Time. Thank you. The floor is yours. Um, thanks so much for, for having us and including a political theory perspective alongside the wonderful empirical research and um, reports by practitioners that we've seen. And apologize, we couldn't be there um, in person. I had I got COVID just two days before uh, I was supposed to fly over. And today is the first day that I feel well, but today is the last day of the conference. So that was that. Um, our presentation is going to echo many of the points about how Roma actually contribute uh, to recycling that was that were made during yesterday's panel, um, in particular by uh, Diego and Elena mentioning the specific contributions that that, that Roma um, have in uh, helping countries meet their recycling target. We will also um, echo something that Tamara said um, after the first panel on pollution about how um, the way people live um, in their circumstances gets um, pathologized. And this truck, according to me, was um, actually grew up right next to a dump in Colentina in, in Bucharest. And um, at, at that age, I was very little. The garbage itself was just there and we would play in it. But the fact that it was that I was made to feel uh, ashamed of it by others, that that was um, a particular wrong making factor for me. And that's what the presentation focuses on um, today, on what what's wrong about pathologizing a certain uh, way in which people live with uh, with uh, with the waste. And to draw out uh, this contrast, um, let's think of the, the discrepancy that there is between the attitudes we tend to have about recycling in general, which is overwhelmingly positive, recycling reduces <clears throat> and pollution, uh, saves on costs, and so on and so forth, and the stigmatizing views we have of a certain type of recycling, in particular, um, the, the focus today is on um, scrap metal recycling, which was so stigmatizing that when a Romanian tennis player, Simona Halep, um, was um, um, not accused, but uh, it was intimated that she might be um, a scrap metal collector, this led to an international scandal in which both the French um, ambassador um, who defended the um, 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 magazine that, that made this joke, Charlie Hebdo, gave a declaration and the Romanian ambassador to, to France gave, um, gave a declaration. So how can it be that we have such positive attitudes of recycling in general, but such stigmatizing views about, um, about scrap metal recycling? recycling in particular. So that what we did um, is to look at the stereotype of uh, scrap metal recycling as an ethnicized stereotype um, that equates scrap metal collecting with um, theft. And I'll take you through some uh, of the evidence we have for this, the existence of this ethnicized stereotype. And then comes the more theoretical part in which we discuss why is this stereotype morally wrong. And we go through um, the main um, uh, um, approaches that we have 
two stereotypes um, that have to do with, well, stereotypes are inaccurate, stereotypes are disrespectful, and uh, stereotypes uh, replicate unjust social relations. Um, and we'll show that each of these capture one facet of what makes this particular stereotype morally wrong, um, but that uh, a better understanding comes from the notion of ecological um, citizenship. And I particularly um, liked the notion of ecological citizenship because it focuses on what Roma are, the Roma are contributing um, to our environment and why um, actually the non-Roma already start from a position of not fulfilling some duties and on top of that comes the wrong of stigmatization. So we argued that the first approach accuracy is not sufficient. This respect um, it, it pales in comparison to other uh, concerns and unjust relations um, only um, only cover uh, uh, some aspects of what is wrong. Um, and then um, the notion of ecological citizenship, we say, can even be improved if we take into account some lessons from the Roma case. Um, the evidence we found for an ethnocide stereotype, not that any of you, I suppose, need this um, evidence, but just, just to be precise, um, we looked at the coverage of um, scrap metal collect collecting in general on um, the DG24 platform, which is the largest news platform in uh, Romania, and they extensively covered the um, Simona Halep uh, scandal. Um, and we found that the ratio of positive to negative um, uh, articles about uh, scrap metal recycling is just under one in 20. So for every one positive article about scrap metal recycling, there are over 19. Um, that equates scrap metal recycling with something, with something um, bad. And it's not just poverty and uh, theft that are mentioned as, um, as um, um, negative aspects, but also illicit wealth uh, from scrap metal collecting. So there's even one article that has this picture of a palace that was allegedly built uh, with money from scrap metal um, collecting. And um, because many of the articles mentioned theft, the uh, ethnicity of the culprits isn't mentioned. But if you read between the lines, you'll see that whenever ethnicity of scrap metal collectors is mentioned, the ethnicity, <laughs> with the exception of the um, Halep scandal, always Romani. So we take this as evidence that there is actually an ethnicized um, stereotype because whenever you see um, 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 scrap metal collecting being mentioned in relation to uh, an ethnicity is the Roma ethnicity and because it's overwhelmingly negative stories. Um, now, the, the um, uh, exception that I mentioned is also very interesting for our, uh, for our discussion, and this is the uh, Simona Halep case. Um, and what's uh, very revealing about that one is that the, the stereotype as it was employed uh, against Halep piggybacks on anti-Roma um, prejudice. And you can see this in uh, other reactions um, that were to the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, news story at the time. Um, in the Deutsche Welle, they called it uh, a racist uh, cartoon. Uh, several um, sports websites also mentioned racism. And one, um, CBS um, actually says, outrage over Halep gypsy cartoon. So the, the in, in in the Halep case, no ethnicity is mentioned, but everyone read it as being actually uh, um, uh, against the, uh, the Roma. So we discuss this as a potential counterexample, and we say that actually, um, even in this example, um, the uh, ethnicization of scrap metal uh, collection plays a part. So again, we take this as evidence that there is a, a stereotype uh, where we understand um, stereotype as a structure of attitudes. So now comes the theoretical part. What makes this stereotype morally um, wrong? Um, well, and the, one of the oldest views is that stereotypes uh, are uh, wrong because they are inaccurate generalizations. Um, yet more, research, more recent research has found that stereotypes based on race, gender, or ethnicity are often um, accurate. 
And even if they are accurate, that doesn't mean that uh, it's right to entertain them. For instance, a stereotype that women employees of childbearing age will go on maternity leave might well be um, accurate because women, well, will have age, will have children at some point, many of them, and that's medically the childbearing age. But that doesn't mean that entertaining the stereotype about every, any woman that enters the workforce um, is, is uh, morally permissible. Mm, just a second, because I've lost my I've lost my screen for some reason. All right, there we go. Um, the, the, second, uh, the second view is that stereotypes are morally, morally wrong because they treat people disrespectfully. They uh, say a judgment about uh, a person in light of what we know about uh, the group. And applying group level characteristics to individual persons uh, assumes that each individual will behave identically to every other group member. And this is uh, disrespectful. So by this logic, the, the stereotype um, about Roma scrap metal collecting is wrong when applied to Halep, an individual person, because it assumes that she would behave identically to other uh, group members, namely um, the Roma. And this is interesting because uh, it was an actual view entertained about the Halep scandal, people saying, well, um, the French only believe this uh, about Halep because they haven't dealt with Romanians, they have dealt mostly with Roma. Um, but the stereotype nonetheless holds for Romanis is still um, racist. And in fact, um, it's instructive to look at why this view fails to, um, to dismount this understanding as well. And um, the view that uh, stereotypes are morally wrong because of, uh, because of reproducing unjust relations, this is the one that we think captures uh, a lot of what is morally wrong about um, this case. It explains why stereotypes are wrong even when they are factually um, correct, because um, even when correct, the behavior can result from past discrimination, so it's wrong to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to say something um, uh, bad about about that. Um, it explains why the wrong making feature is uh, not uh, something that has to do with individuals because um, the injustice affects occupants of subordinate social positions. And it explains why the cartoon was wrong, even if it was uh, a joke, because humor piggybacks on and furthers um, uh, the stereotype um, further. But this presents only a partial view of what makes a stereotype morally wrong because it overlooks the fact that those in positions of authority have the power to paint certain behaviors as desirable or undesirable in the first place. And we think that's the root cause of what makes the stereotype um, morally wrong. And DG24 contributes um, to um, the way uh, the behavior is framed through its negative um, reporting. And this is an overlooked power that mainstream institutions like the media, politicians, and even jokes um, have. And now I give over to Kian to tell us what ecological citizenship can say about it. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about a uh, political philosophy, political theory concept, uh, ecological citizenship, which we think has a lot of helpful things to say um, at this point. Oh, am I on video? video? Second. Oh, I am on video. Great. Great. Okay. So um, Andrew Dobson uh, introduces this concept of ecological citizenship and argues that ecological citizenship includes dispositions we should entertain toward each other in light of having uh, co-creating certain kinds of international impacts on um, ecological and especially climate environmental context. So in this context, we're interested both in how the Roma and their interlocutors uh, might be ecological citizens. On the Roman side, uh, scrap collecting is, uh, in a very conscious way, as we heard from our colleagues, uh, Elena and Diego, uh, especially yesterday, um, re really reduces the impact of metal materiality on others. And this, uh, in turn, reduces the uh, footprints of others um, and also supports some related industries. But most importantly, in this way that we're ecological citizens towards each other, um, this actually reduces the environmental impact. 
So in a very concrete way, that makes them uh, a certain kind of good ecological citizen. Uh, conversely, on the media side, uh, one might be curious about what these uh, French potential ecological citizens owe to others, in particular, uh, the Romani, the Romanian Romani. Are they, are they being virtuous? And so Dobson is especially interested in what kind of virtuous relationships we might have as ecological citizens. So the first point to make is that simply because we think this concept is especially relevant because it's not dependent on being co-nationals or being within the same uh, national boundaries. We think that- One minute uh, left. Thank you. We think along with Dobson that nationalities have um, duties of regardless of where they're from. So one, I'll, I'll say one quick uh, objection and then-, and then So um, one objection you might have is that citizenship is not the appropriate a concept to be a good thing. We might think we might be concerned that citizenship is not the thing that uh, the, Roma, the Roma people are actually uh, representing. Um, so you might think, for example, that operating within a market economy by doing market relationships um, isn't a public process in the right way. Uh, but Dobson is explicit that again, this makes ecological citizenship really helpful because it's about the impact. It's about uh, reducing each other's footprint. It's about what our climate, environmental, and ecological co-impacts uh, are, not where those um, impacts come from. So they can come from market-based or even private actions, for example, in their own home. So there's another objection, but due to lack of time, I will leave that for now. So what we think is that by looking at this uh, media, we can see a set of harmful stereotypes um, again, looking at it from a conceptual uh, political theory point of view, we think that there are several potential wrong-making features which are often discussed in the context of stereotypes. Uh, but as um, uh, Deanna mentioned, there's, there's some of these don't seem to capture uh, the relevant context here. And in particular, they tend to be things that are uh, don't have this international character in the way that ecological citizenship does. So we think that that has these twin benefits of both recognizing these ecological ties and it shows how scrap collecting, surprisingly, even though it's a market-based activity, can be citizenly in the relevant sense. And our overall um, intention is to indicate how environmental racism and environmental justice intersect with and are mediated by these stereotypes. Um, and we think that ecological citizenship, this political philosophy, political theory concept, is really helpful in elucidating that. We look forward to your questions. Thank you very much also um, for this very important point uh, of your paper, which was many important points, but showing how uh, authority um, uses its power to even really try and something positive to something negative by using ethnological oh, yeah. uh, stereotypes is uh, quite an important point also when you think about the fact that often art and satire uh, comedy is framed as something that cannot go over boundaries. This is a quite philosophical and deep point about uh, the whole uh, discussion. Um, thank you very much both for your presentations and I invite now Nicola Venkov, mm -hmm. uh, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. Yes, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to present some of your work here. I'm really looking forward to getting some feedback of how to actually construct it for international academic audience, because this was a paper which I wrote in Bulgarian for Bulgarian context. And I'm still not sure how it should talk to <coughs> international audience. Um, now, um, I'm going to talk about a case study. I've been spending in this neighborhood around five years of my research working on different topics and also supporting uh, local, local people who enter some activist uh, initiatives. Um, and so in this case, I want to talk about how um, Roma uh, community is produced uh, when there is no actual Roma there, at least from their own uh, identification. Um, and so uh, here I'm talking about production, not in a historical sense, but uh, like as an ongoing process, uh, everyday process. Um, and this is an instance of racialization. So I'm talking about racialization. Um, 
Then I focus specifically on the role of media and government, as well as the mediating role of garbage in this process. Um, so, uh, Stolipin so is uh, the neighborhood is located in Polish in Bulgaria, um, which uh, it's no well known Roma neighborhood, or actually the biggest one in, in, in the country. Uh, well known <laughs> is inhabited by Roma. The media, government, international NGOs, academic publications, and your taxi driver when you're going there will tell you this is, uh, uh, you know, home neighborhoods. Um, and, um, however, most people there identify actually as Turkish, and there is a small, there is a small part over here where around 10%, there are two groups. Live there. So there is a 10% Roma living in this part, and all the rest I didn't write as uh, Turkish. I will not go into um, too much into uh, this because we need much time. Um, <clears throat> now it's very similar in terms of urban environment uh, to the case about Lunik in Slovakia. So you can imagine like it, it used to be a mixed neighborhood with Bulgarians, Turkish, Roma, and also other small minorities. Uh, Quite well maintained environment during communist times. There is like four state schools inside, kindergartens, and so on. But since 1990, uh, with all the issues that started with the uh, economic collapse, uh, it's a, a type of white flight started from this in this area. And today there is almost nobody who's living there. And this has uh, become like the uh, in parallel with this, became, starts a lot of uh, spatial segregation, discrimination by uh, the city government, and so on. Um, now, yeah, clarifying identities, I will just uh, go over. Something important that this is kind of a, is not the poorest type of uh, community you usually imagine when you talk about uh, this kind of uh, problematic neighborhoods. Actually, it's a uh, big portion of something that I would call middle class there, over half of the population. This is a study we did uh, statistical study. So the red ones are actually poor people who have really difficult uh, lifetimes. There is also like, similar to Lunik, there is certain areas with informal housing that's where these people would be living. Um, <clears throat> now, there, the residents of Stolipin will suffer from a big kind of issues in the realms of uh, employment discrimination, security of tenure, the provision of urban infrastructure by the by this local government. However, the two biggest pains which trigger the most discussion and agitation uh, in the community, uh, one is about their identity not being recognized, and the other, the second one is the ever-present garbage in the neighborhood. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, here is just some from Facebook. I copied some uh, discussion points. I won't be reading it, so you can have a look here. Um, now, everyone in Stolipin has to live near garbage dumps, regardless of their own economic success and lifestyle. And there is now a significant group of residents who wish to lead a more dignified life in their neighborhood. However, they feel colonists from three sides. One is the problematic coexistence with those other neighbors who do not share their investments. The other is the machinations of Bulgarian institutions who do not maintain uh, proper waste removal. And the third is the brutal stigmatization of their community from the outside through the garbage problem. And I will talk here about the second two things. Um, now, I had a video here, but it's complicated with uh, uh, you know, Zoom and so on. So uh, this behind the column that continues for another 30 meters. And you can see this is right inside an urban environment. This is the street with dust hall, their houses all around. Actually, the corner is a state school. Here. There is expensive cars passing and BMW and so on. But you have this big pile of rubbish. Uh, yes, a little bit of uh, theoretical background I am uh, using. Um, so, what I understand by racialization, this is the ongoing production of race. Um, and it kind of discursively turns socioeconomic inequality into natural uh, inequality, uh, kind of creating different subspecies of the humans, different genres by one of the authors here, which do not have the same, like, we kind of don't expect from them the same claims and needs about their life. Um, 
This is, in a sense, partial dehumanization. Um, now, importantly, this, uh, for me, this works subconsciously. It is embodied in our perceptions. It is before ideology and uh, innovation thinking. Um, it's a kind of habit which gets implicated. So even if I am very anti-racist uh, by my ideology, I still have my initial 10 seconds of perceiving certain uh, bodies, landscapes, and so on, as, uh, as especially as these fundamental Roman landscapes. Um, here is uh, oh yeah, something to mention, uh, racial assemblage. So there are a lot of different markers which we recognize as part of uh, this, uh, let's say, racial figure of Roma. And uh, seeing some of them activates the rest, even if they're not present. This is the theory I'm using. And here is a, a picture by a Bulgarian painter who, uh, for me, really gives the entire racial assemblage how Bulgarians see uh, Roma. Uh, and you can see it quite, has quite many different markers. Um, and actually, Stulip in the Wolf fits some of these markers. And I'm arguing that's why it is so stably recognized as Roma neighborhood. Um, Okay, now the, the Median Bulgaria is an important uh, purveyor of, of this uh, uh, discourses because there is no uh, strong, uh, you know, in Bulgarian society, there is no strong anti racist uh, front and uh, it's not controlled by policy or anything like that. Uh, and the, 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 the media can really indulge into, into this. Um, in the production and circulation of racialized images. Uh, now, what's interesting is that the Stulipino specifically is so well connected with the figure of this, this being a gypsy neighborhood or today Roma quarter, that they don't even have to mention anymore Roma. So in this title, um, it says, uh, in Stulipino, they continue to not understand what uh, bin is used for. Or some are dirtying, others are cleaning. This is about the municipal services. But the picture is to look in never changes, uh, and so on. A wedding amid two, 200 tons of rubbish, and shocking mm -hmm. pictures, and so on. So they don't even have to, you know, you mentioned to look in the end, uh, the leader is already automatically, this is already racialized. Uh, uh, the notion. So automatically, this is the Roman neighborhood and it's related to the rubbish and everything else. Um, <clears throat> now, there is kind of a division of labor. So you get authoritative media which just present facts in a very neutral manner, like, you know, 70 tons of garbage were removed from Stilipino, you know, this is on national radio. Um, then you get this kind of tabloid uh, media, which uh, just introduce all this nastiness into the discourse and all these uh, epithets and so on. Uh, but I think what I'm claiming is that these things actually work together in the public uh, sphere. So they inculcate certain uh, uh, perceptions and you complete the picture. So you, you see the, the neutral title, but in your head, you already completed all these other uh, things. And uh, the, the administration, the politicians, uh, make use of this uh, by actually saying very uh, politically correct, expressing themselves, but always introducing uh, some hints which, uh, you know, separate those groups when right. they talk about them. So the final title, for example, uh, this works so that because they know that people from Stulipin will now also read, uh, you know, in the internet and so on, and they would not recognize actually what is hidden in their way of speaking, but the Bulgarian leader automatically activates uh, all the other things. Um, and something about the rational assemblage, which actually you see some uh, markers, such as the inf little points of informal housing, there's no asphalt, and you automatically complete everything else. You can see that there's actually no rubbish here. And people, they water the place, clean it every morning and so on. Uh, that's a better looking street. Um, here is the little pile, sorry, I mouse. Here is the little pile of rubbish, which is waiting for the municipality to come at some point, because there's no bins there, and take it. But it's quite ordered. However, 
the Bulgarian person even passing through there would not recognize this. Um, there is an inside street, something that uh, when when uh, politicians are talking, why is not clean in Stolipino? They say our equipment cannot enter these overbuilt little streets, but they're actually the cleanest ones. Those people are maintaining themselves. So uh, I will skip quite quickly, but I am saying there is a really strong symbiosis between uh, uh, city administration and the, the media. Um, which is not the case when it's uh, some problems concerning Bulgarians. Usually the media is used as an instrument to pressure uh, public administration, but it doesn't work for people in the um, And uh, I'm calling this media government uh, complex, and I think it comes mainly from uh, the racialization, which these actors share. Uh, and I'll just give one uh, discursive example about this idea how how the Roma cannot use the bins. They just throw outside and then there's why, that's why it's so much rubbish. So here's this screenshot from the video where they're, sh they're doing the big cleaning and uh, the inspector is saying, <laughs> yeah, I have given the quotes, which in the next uh, reportage, the journalist made into like a nice pun. He enjoyed himself to you know, make it. Uh, here the media, when, when locals, uh, I was helping them to organize, make a petition with 600 signatures and so on. And this time there was a wave of publications by the media, so they really activated to counter uh, the local mobilization. And they started making like before and after pictures, like we clean and, you know, next day it's again the same, but the bins are empty and so on. Now, um, why really there is so much rubbish? Uh, like what is the material uh, flows that are happening? Um, and one thing that I will mention specifically about this, why the bins are empty, is actually you can see here the bin truck. It's really passing every morning as they're promising more because we're cleaning every day. But it only empties the bins. And everything that overfilled collects here for weeks. And then during the day, you think, oh, they didn't throw anything in the bin. So there is actually a conscious strategy of uh, by the municipality. Uh, these are pictures from uh, local people. The balcony, uh, there is all these uh, little companies which bring over their illegal dumps, so similar to the case in uh, Belgrade, um, because they know it's a place where there's lots of rubbish, so they bring their own and they don't pay some fees and so on. And it's, that's quite huge. Another thing is actually uh, when we started to counting the bins, uh, they are half the official number, which is still very small. So there's 80 bins for 40,000 population by documents. Actually, there were 47, and I made a map of the red is the actual situation, the black is the black, white is the play documents. One minute. Okay, uh, and they're only in the periphery. You can see there is a huge territory, only one bin in the very center. So what happens there is there is all these uh, very, very poor and marginalized members of the community who uh, make their living by Passing the streets and people from the houses for 50 cents, they take their bag of rubbish to transport it to the bins area. So every day people just throw their rubbish and they pay for it. Uh, that's why the internal streets are clean. And then you get this huge amount of rubbish which overfills the bins. So you see this like in the near the evening, and it's, which for me also was like, wow, there's so much rubbish. And it's probably been staying here for weeks or something, but this is actually in the morning. This is just after cleaning by the municipality. There is like one bin or two bins, and this is the rest. Um, <laughs> yeah, the summary. Uh, there is a social, social spatial inequalities about uh, uh, waste management because it's actually a, a, you know, a mode of managing urban space. And so where inhabitants are marginalized because of racialization, there is easy to, you know, this we talked yesterday about this lack of accountability of public authorities. So it's easy to overlook uh, the way they're working. Um, and the big thing is that uh, locals cannot rely on the media to actually bring this issue up because the media will side with the authorities when they come. Um, and yeah, we get to environmental racism for this. Uh, and this also replaces this cycle of uh, living in the place of trauma. 
And uh, yeah, just want to mention that thanks to this paper published in Bulgarian, actually there was some mm -hmm. effect because we uh, saw that the bins are much less than the agreed documents. There was a big campaign how suddenly their municipality is donating 50 bins to the neighborhood. Uh, and they made lots of interviews again, all the money is there for them. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful example again for how authority, power, and media are able to, to, to reframe uh, and define narratives. Um, so the next presentation by Mr. Daniel Skola, Slovak Academy of Sciences, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, to the organizers for inviting uh, me to present uh, the paper. And at the same time, I would like to uh, apologize my uh, co-author and um, co-researcher, uh, Richard Filtra, who cannot be here with us because he has some other duty. He must be in another place in these days. <clears throat> well, in this, uh, what do we... What are we going to do in this uh, in this article is we try to uh, critically uh, explore the emergence uh, of uh, segregated uh, Roma settlement, which we call Lipnica, uh, which is located on the outskirts of uh, the district town in central Slovakia, a uh, town called Muran. Uh, uh, it is important to say that we change uh, for the purpose of the of the presentation and the article. We change the uh, names of the of the town and, and, and locality. So these are fictitious names, and you cannot find it uh, on the map. But otherwise, I mean, all uh, facts are uh, are real, and also the other uh, uh, regional kind of uh, top, top, top names are are, are, uh, are real. The, you can see the settlement uh, on the on the slide, and also you can see how in. How much in close proximity of the of the huge landfill it it, it, it is located? Uh, the origin of the settlement dates back to the period of uh, of the 1990s, the period of of, of post socialist restructuring of the of the economy. And uh, as we will try to show later, I mean, I, I think that the, the 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 changes in national and local economy. Uh, which intersect with racial discrimination uh, resulted in creation of the of this segregated of this segregated uh, Roma quasi uh, ghetto in close proximity of, 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 of the dam. The settlement was in the in the mid of 1990s. It was established as a temporary residential area uh, with low standard apartments to relocate uh, people. Who were in areas uh, in rental municipal housing in the town, and uh, also these these people were at the same time considered by the authorities uh, uh, of the town like socially maladjusted uh, adjusted individuals. Um, although the uh, the documentation at the time and the local and the local press at the time did not ever did to mention any ethnicity any any ethnic. Uh, uh, any ethnicity in relation to the settlement, it happened that all the people who were in fact relocated from the from the town to the to the settlement of were of, of Roma origin. So this 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 uh, uh, settlement is located on the outskirts on the town. I mean it is in industrial zone. You cannot see the whole industrial zone of the picture. But uh, 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 it is separated by the river and railway line from the from the uh, from the town. And in, in fact, it's, it's disconnected from completely to the to the town. The population. Uh, I can show you another uh, another drawn uh, picture of the, of the settlement. You can see it is small settlement. Originally, there were, there were only one hundred and fifty people relocated, uh, and. Um, uh, from from the from the from the city center and uh, originally in 1997 there was only one apartment building with 11 flats and uh, and these these modular cabins you can see there were 14 modular cabins uh, there 
And uh, later in, in 2007, uh, two more apartment buildings with 18 flats were uh, built, built over there, uh, which accommodated another uh, almost 200, uh, 200 people. The whole locality is only partially uh, sewered and uh, I mean, the, 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 and partially connected to the to the water pipelines. Uh, modular cabins are not connected to the to the water uh, needed to to sewer. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I mean, the, the whole locality lacks basic amenities. There there, there are no like food paths. The lighting you can see is non-functional. In fact, so waste is collected in non-standard way by using uh, large capacity containers. Uh, which are emptied only once a month or so. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. So I mean, in, in our uh, well, theoretical thinking about the, about the, uh, about this case, we consider uh, two uh, interrelated theoretical uh, frameworks, like uh, one is uh, ethnic discrimination as such, and second one is environmental uh, justice. And uh, I, I think we can see that we can see this uh, this uh, creation uh, uh, of, of the settlement as a special form of collective violence that is con that, that is um, located in urban space and, and and is a result of both deterioration of, of economic situation and also uh, is based on the political decision, as I will. Uh, argue uh, uh, soon. Regarding the methodology very briefly, I mean, we uh, closely read the, the official uh, permitting uh, processes documents for the, for the landfill construction. Uh, we relied on the archival research. We read the uh, local newspapers and also, uh, uh, I mean, other other local sources, and uh, which which provide us very important, I mean, information on the chronology of events. And also, we supplemented these methods with ethnographic observation in the locality, which all stays there, and uh, interviews with uh, with actors and also with with uh, with inhabitants of the locality. Uh, I mean, you can see here uh, uh, also some pictures of the, of the uh, landfill. Uh, I don't have so much time to go deeply in the theory, but just very briefly, I mean, uh, um, regarding the environmental justice, the empirical evidence indicates that uh, access to natural resources and exposure to environmental risks is not evenly distributed, but uh, the social class and ethnic ethnicity play an important role. I mean, there was lots of literature on the on, on this, uh, and uh, structurally disadvantaged uh, groups, ethnic groups or social groups. I mean, are more likely to suffer uh, adverse environmental impacts. Uh, in Slovak context. Uh, um, the the, 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 the the research on the environmental injustice is is, is understudied in fact so uh, there were uh, there were some researches which were done by uh, 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 me and uh, Richard and other collaborators um, um, but uh, I mean not to go too much too much into that uh, we can say that um, uh, based on the empirical evidence in some previous work, we, we try to identify the, uh, the three groups of factors uh, which, which, uh, uh, which uh, um, I mean, related to the, to the, uh, to the Roma uh, exposure to the adverse environmental impact. And these are more or less in line with the researches which were done in other social political contexts, such, uh, for example, the US, USA uh, context. And this, this group of factors are uh, the first group of factors is related to the economic use of land. The second group of factors is, is related to the distemperament of Roma and their weak position in, in the power structures. And third group of uh, factors relates to to the local inter-ethnic relations and the history of inter-ethnic relations. Uh, very briefly on the situation in the city, which because this is this is uh, in the town uh, and in the region, because this is 
in our perspective, very important. <clears throat> this town uh, that is the center of our attention was, was in the post-World uh, War period, traditionally hard of uh, heavy engineering industry in Slovakia. It was prosperous town. During the whole existence of Czechoslovakia, there was built uh, um, the heavy machinery plant, and also uh, uh, there was a production of steel structures, trains, but most importantly of, uh, of production of military tanks, which uh, were uh, uh, not only for the use of the, for the Czechoslovak army, but they were exported uh, all over the world, uh, at least all over the, the sphere of Soviet influence to the countries like Libya, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iran, etc., etc. So, but uh, uh, in Five the minutes, uh, sorry, okay. In the late of 1980s, uh, uh, the gradual phase, phase, phasing out of military production began, and after the 1990, after the, the abrupt political changes, uh, the, the, the military production stopped. So, uh, in fact, it, it, it was also the, the symbolically the beginning of deindustrialization of the 1990s and deterioration of economic economic situation. And serious, uh, which which caused serious problems for the for the section of of, of, of population, uh, a typical downturn spiral for the uh, affected people involved a loss of jobs, which was followed by raising rents and costs of living, and which led also to the areas in debts uh, for the for the rental for the rental housing. Uh, uh, on the background of this, uh, the, the uh, town representatives in 1996 uh, decided to move those who are in areas uh, to new new locality uh, on, the, on the edge of town and in this close proximity of, of the landfill. But it should be noted importantly that uh, uh, this locality was built there only after the construction of uh, uh, landfill. I mean, landfill was already there because uh, landfill was constructed in 1994. So, uh, and few words on the on the on the landfill on the dump. I mean, the, the the construction of this landfill, which is of regional importance, was divided into several stages. And the first stage was scheduled uh, 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 to 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 be sufficient for eight years. But in 2008, the decision was made to expand already existing uh, existing waste dump. Uh, it is also important to know that there are methodological instructions on the on the construction of waste dump and storage of waste. And for example, there are norms. There are legal norms and technical norms that specify that landfill may not be established in the immediate vicinity of the of the settlements of the of the estates where human uh, lives. So the minimum distance should be 500 uh, meters uh, in the direction uh, of preloading bins, as, as it says. And all these technical standards, of, of course, were violated in the, in the case of, of, of Litnica. And what is also interesting, how the environmental impact assessment report uh, deals with this fact. Uh, as you know, I mean, this is the requirement, uh, legal requirement for the, for the construction of environmental uh, structures that all these structures must must be uh, uh, must be must be uh, evaluated or assessed in this environmental impact assessment report. And this report, for example, states on the page seventy six that all residential estates, with the exception of Lipnica, are several times further from the areas of interest than uh, than the norm uh, uh, rights. Oh, and I, I will repeat that all residential estates, with the exception of Lipnica, are far further than I mean, they are all right. So that means it is all right. So it's it's pretty option. Uh, or uh, on the page thirty-seven, the distance from the nearest residential areas is large enough so the odor from the landfill does not manifest itself at all. The impact of the smell is manifested only in the Lipnica residential area. So I mean. Uh, I, I think this highlights that the fact that Roma of Litnica were symbolically excluded from the from the moral community of the of the of the town inhabitants. Uh, well, as I, so I'm running off time, so one minute. Okay, so I'm coming to the conclusion. 
this case of Lipnica is interesting from, from more reasons, because, I mean, the establishment of this settlement can be, which can be considered quasi-ethnic, can be perceived as a result of several interconnected uh, economic and political processes. And uh, these processes were taking place at the background of the changes on the labor market, privatization and closure of local uh, industry, which result in the structural unemployment. And um, I mean, this overall dominance of economic neoliberalism in 1990s caused the number of people, of number of 30 plus people, including Roma, who work in the heavy engineering industry in the town, lost their jobs. And they were consequently unable to pay rent and utilities. And, uh, and uh, it caused, I mean, the authorities to decide to evict them from the municipal rented apartments to the to the uh, to the uh, to the locality on the edge of, of, of edge of town. So um, and also, I mean, the, stru the structural and institutional discrimination was coupled with the discourse blaming and stigmatizing Roma. I mean, and it, I think it, it has functioned that it enabled to legitimize these this, uh, these decisions and these steps. Uh, so I think yes, yeah, last sentence, please. So I think that this this uh, Lipnica settlement is uh, also an important example that demystifies uh, Roma spatial segregation and points out that it is primarily economic processes and the and the political uh, and the very political decisions of the non-Roma ruling. Uh, uh, ruling class, ruling minority, majority, that are uh, the reason for the emergence and persistence of, of, of Roma, Roma, of segregated Roma, Roma settlements. There is no culture and some like very uh, mi mi mystic reasons for that. I mean, it's very, it's very result of the very concrete uh, political uh, decisions. I will still be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, now we have reached the point where our discussant, Alexios Antipas, Associate Professor for the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy from Central European University, will reflect on the four presentations that we've heard. Um, for 10 minutes, the floor is yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah? yes. Right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, First, I just want to uh, <clears throat> express my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to participate today. This is really a pleasure. Um, I want to begin by some very, just a very general thought, and then perhaps a suggestion, and then um, you know my thoughts on 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 the papers, all of which I I really enjoyed both listening to and and reading. My, my general thought is this, and I've been thinking about this as I've been listening today. Um, I, I, I very much wonder at what stage uh, we are in the integration or let's say the sort of, you know, um, what degree of cooperation and integration we have between the environmental and Roma communities, advocacy communities, um, at policy, so environmental policy as well as social policy and scholarship. And, you know, I don't know how many people here are aware of the fact that, you know, some 20 years ago, we launched a, a, an environmental justice with a Roma focus um, research and, and at, you know, uh, kind of, of, of stream here at CEU and Richard Filchak. Daniel's co-author was, so far as I know, he was my PhD student. So far as I know, he was the very first person to produce a PhD dissertation dealing with this issue. So environmental justice and the Roma community in, in Slovakia. And we held a few um, conferences that, oops, that jumped up. A few conferences on this issue inviting both Roma and, and environmental communities, activists, lawyers, and others, and, and Daniel was a part of that at the time, too. And now I see that there are young scholars uh, working in this area, and there's some degree of, of integration. And I just wonder, it would be very interesting if, if some of these young scholars or older scholars 
would do a kind of historical view and look at the development of how these issues have, have started to interact with each other and an assessment of how, um, uh, you know, how well this integration is working because I, I, I see that like there's been a lot of progress and yet it's very limited. You know, you can't say this is kind of A-level performance. And so it'd be really interesting for somebody to look at that and to kind of, you know, develop some ideas of how to further the cooperation between these communities to, to, to achieve more progress, not just scholarly progress, but also, you know, work on the ground and in the policy arena. So it struck me in reading the Chabai paper that it and, and then I looked and I saw right there is no EU level for instance strategy on um the Roma in in the green energy transition I, I haven't found I, I may be wrong maybe there's some white paper somewhere or some other you know work that I couldn't quickly find on Google search but um that seems to be a, like a huge omission and you know, without that, I mean, you, you know, you have no idea what will happen at the member state level, sorry, at the member state level, much less at municipal levels. So, you know, and, and I think that's just a kind of indicator that a lot is missing. Okay. Um, I really liked the the fact that the 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 paper um, by Chabai is coming out of an action research um, uh, you know approach because you know first off and I think that should be brought out more. I mean, I really think it should be brought out more in the paper and kind of expanded upon because it it is potentially some of the most impactful kind of research that could be done. I think if you're doing action research, if you're really on the ground and trying to so help solve very practical problems, uh, rather than thinking in only in very abstract theoretical terms or looking at structural issues and so on, this is where a great deal of progress can probably be made. And of course, it reflects back onto the onto the structural issues and allows action researchers to have a deeper understanding of of how those structural issues actually come to be and function. Um, at the same time, though, another thought that I had in reading that is I'm not like immediately convinced by the paper that you need to have lots and lots of research, um, you know, on on all on each locality or something like that for the purposes of developing policy for the purposes of action research of course it totally makes sense um, but for instance for the purposes of developing policy um, but at least it begs the question of how many different types are there right and what are the diff what are what kind of policy mixes and at what levels um, could work for those different types of localities with their different types of problems. And there I thought, well, it would be interesting to have some or have a number of multiple comparative case studies, right? So this was focused on in this one district in, in, um, in one city, but multiple comparative case studies uh, within countries and also between countries at the locality level, I think would be really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that was my, well, I had one more comment there, which was on, you mentioned the, mentioned Ostrom, which is great, but I think that would be nice to understand more of how you think Ostrom could be helpful, right? So I would just expand that a little bit. Um, and I agree, Ostrom is, is certainly interesting. And I'm aware of time, so I'm take I'm almost taking too much time. I'm going to go a little faster. Um, the Popescu article it made me think of the work of uh, Mary Douglas uh, on on pollution and taboo purity and danger, and and this is where Mary Douglas defines dirt as matter out of place, and that concept has been applied uh, in the context of racism. Uh, where you know where you have people out of place and uh, dirt 
you know, what we consider dirty uh, is, a, is Mary Douglas explains or, or theorizes that this is, it's a threat um, to the social order. It disrupts the social order. So we have to find some way of purifying it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this reminded me of the scrap metal. It reminded me of the way waste uh, is recycled partially. One of the ways in which waste is recycled in Budapest, the town in which I live, which is a, each district regularly has uh, a day where people can throw all their junk and stuff they don't want anymore out on the street. And um, it stays there for about 12 to 24 hours. And the next morning, uh, big trucks come by and, and pick up what's there. But in the meantime, pe uh, people will come from outside of the district mostly, and mostly, I'm a, I was overwhelmingly Roma, and sift through all of that and, and take away what, what they can use. And um, so, you know, this is a, you know, it's clearly a recycling um, process and it's a very beneficial one, but it is considered the way, you know, it's kind of like that, that cartoon, right? It's, it's considered this dirty thing. First off, it's dirt that's being, it's like matter out of place that's being put on the street. It's out of place on the street. It really fills up the sidewalks and the streets, right? It, it looks horrible uh, momentarily. It's gone within 24 hours. Um, but then the people who come are also completely out of place from the view of the districts because they come from the outside, they're Roma. There's this, you know, association of the dirt on the street and, and the dirtiness of the people, right? Um, because it, it's no different in Hungary than it is in Romania or, or, or anywhere else as far as all of this goes. Um, well, Sorry. Yeah. Okay. The irony is that you've got green consumers who are relatively wealthy throwing out their their you know unusable the stuff that they no longer want to use and that's actually being recycled. So I would ask myself. One of the things I would ask myself is what are the social functions of discrimination and the interrelationship between the environment and discrimination? Um, relegating scrap metal recycling to the Roma keeps the Roma going, right? Uh, financially, economically, and therefore it reduces pressure on the government to create more effective social programs. I mean, that's one of the ways in which I see it. But of course, it also gets it, you know, it, it's this wonderful and cheap, free for government uh, recycling process. Um, so, you know, trying to understand the, the you know, the, these functions. Another framework you've got, uh, you've got the citizenship framework. I, I would kind of uh, also look at the sustainable livelihoods framework uh, as, as useful there. And I'll, again, I'll go like as fast as I can here. I don't have as much to say about Richard and Daniel's uh, paper, except that I think it's a wonderful paper that shows kind of this iron, it's like this iron cage argument, right? It reminds me a little bit of Weber at the end of, of, of um, Spirit of Capitalism, that it's something you can't get out of, the, the, the sort of historical path dependency that puts people in a certain place that they literally, like, they're just in an iron cage, they, they can't get out. So it really does beg the question, how do you start to take some of those bars off off the cages. And then you didn't mention this. There's a very almost an aside in the paper about the kids who are who were bused from this area to their school. And that I couldn't quite get from the paper, but it almost reads as though all of the kids are 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 um, diagnosed as retarded or somehow, you know, mentally um, or intellectually inferior. And that, that it's an, an, an inaccurate diagnostic process, but I really think that if you're going to put that in there, it needs to be explained more. Um, like, what is going on here? That would be crazy. And then, you know, what kind of school is this? Is there some special school, you know, for these kids? And why? Why would they all, you know, why would they all be labeled this way? Why would they all be going to a special school? Um, it, it just kind of jumps out at me. And finally, the Venkov paper. Uh, the government media complex, I think this is really good because it shows like it, it, it's a very clear demonstration of the systemic nature of discrimination. Right. And when where systemic means in part that it's not necessarily coordinated by the actors who who cooperate with each other to produce it. They're, you know, it's not a conspiracy kind of thing. Everybody's kind of voluntarily reinforcing the system the way it is. And I think it would be very nice to have some 
interview, you know, in additional future research, interviews, especially with, with the media, with the reporters, and try to understand how, you know, how they choose their stories, how do the editors choose the, the headlines, and, you know, why they don't see alternatives, and especially if they're missing the cleanly, you know, the, the positive stories, how can they miss those, and why do they not choose to report on those, and, and contrast it with the more problematic cases. Okay, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your reflections and thoughts uh, that you've highlighted, certain points about these very interesting and thrilling papers. Um, so now we reached a point where we are going to a dialogue with uh, the offline and online audience. And we start first collecting questions from people who are you know, with us in this room. And in the second stage, we collect questions from people in our online audience. And after collecting all questions, after this, we will answer the questions. So my, the panelists might want to write down questions that they feel uh, interesting to them. To all people who pose questions, please pose your question slowly and clearly. And if you refer to a certain uh, panelist, please directly uh, also say that this question refers to a certain person. So it's easier for us to know who shall answer it. And um, yes, I guess we can immediately start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karen Bell from the University of Glasgow. I do work on environmental justice and just transition. I just wanted to ask Daniel whether the people in that community are. Um, advocating for themselves in any way or campaigning and what are their priorities since we've had so many environmental problems and I know it's that you get chosen to anonymize the community so then you know obviously it doesn't seem like they are advocating for themselves but I'm just wondering I can understand why you would do that because you don't want to be stigmatization um, but maybe you could just talk a bit more about that and then I just briefly wanted to say about Nicola's uh, presentation because I was a community worker for a long time and, and also I lived on a council estate for 40 years. And I saw that um, exactly the same thing happened. So as soon as I saw the photo, I know what's going on here. It's just property of environmental services that are given to communities that don't have to look down at home so they can get away with it. When they, say that people aren't putting the rubbish in the bin, that's exactly what happened in our community. And when we start to make a fuss about it, they took the bins away altogether. <laughs> so it's like, right, you know, we've got nowhere to go. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Daniel, did you uh, understand the question? You have time to write it down. You, you only okay. answer it afterwards because we still go on collecting questions. Now. Okay. Thank you. We have more questions. Second. Hi, and thank you so much for your important work. Uh, my question goes to, to Nicola, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit more on two concepts that you introduced, <laughs> namely racialization and producing a Roma community in a particular context. And I, I'm posing this question because I see racialization in a similar way um, as you do as processes in imposed by dominant groups to set apart groups as deserving and undeserving, grievable and ungrievable, but acknowledging as Geronimus and other scholars do that these identities are based on the oppressed groups, uh, common superficial characteristics of which could be physical related to ancestry or origins and so on. So with that in mind, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in the idea or more so the actions of producing a Roma community as you, uh, as you call it in these specific five uh, segregated communities included in your research. And I guess the question is, um, is racialization or the racialization processes in these five communities uh, distinct processes of race making or producing a Yuvoma community, or is there a different way to understand the nuances of uh, and the space between self identification in state processes, self identification at home, and uh, hetero identification 
or between casting as white or thirds and stating the straws. And I'm ma ma mainly interested in, in what you said at the beginning, that these are five segregate, segregated communities, yet the majority of them identify as thirds. We also know that many Romani people in, in Bulgaria identify as thirds in official processes. So I'm not really sure about how producing a Roma community is somehow a product of media and state uh, um, work. Um, the question is clear for you. Yes, okay. And then maybe one more Complex. question. Complex question. <laughs> yes. I've seen there was and then, uh, oh we have a lot of okay. Uh let's draw Miriam. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Thank you all for this, uh, I think, very enlightening presentation. I two questions, but I will post one uh, to Jason uh, on this ecological citizenship, uh, which I found very interesting and inspiring. But I also wonder to what extent it's not a very privileged um, concept if we relate to what does it mean to recycle or collect waste, uh, especially when you think about women and children. Um, so I think, you know, the context is uh, is also what we have to look at. And I wonder whether there's any thinking of, you know, that we address also in this concept that we look at, uh, what does it mean with regard to health? Is it a health set, um, hazardous environment? What is it, does it mean with regard to education? If children on the street and not being able to go to school. I mean, it's very simple, but I, I want to, to illustrate what I mean. Thank you. The question is clear. To you, thank you. And, and one more question, I guess it's okay. I know you wait already a long time. Uh, I'm Alejandro, I came from the University of Alicante, Spain. And I was wondering, well, my question is for, for the yeah. It was so interesting in the presentation. I was wondering uh, how you define energy poverty and which indicators do you use to measure it? And uh, and if you include some indicator related to health or health outcomes related to energy poverty in your research. Thank you. Thank you. The question is clear to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as we were participating until now, I think we can afford to have one more question uh, inviting out from our online audience, which we really would like to include and appreciate for being with us online. Uh, so, Martin, uh, maybe we have one question from an online audience that we could include. Is there somebody raising their hand? Not yet, but I could see that we have one person. Okay, so we will. You, yeah. So, we'll one more question for me. Thanks for the yeah. presentation. My question to Nicola. Um, as you're beginning of the presentation, I think that uh, there is a two thirds population in this place. I'm wondering the components between the um, ethnicities. Uh, are there any uh, conflicts between the Roma and Turks? Thank you. The question is clear. Thank you. Thank you. So we go into answering the questions, and the first question went to Daniel. So, mm -hmm. so regarding mm -hmm. whether local people uh, living in the Lipinsa settlement are advocating or complaining about the situation, I. I uh, I have no evidence about uh, some like more organized or coordinated robust uh, protest, but probably they are complaining like, individually. Of, I mean, uh, for example, in this environmental impact assessment report, there is, uh, in some place, there is stated that uh, uh, probably as these officers were doing interviews with the local people, there is stated that some people complain about the odor from the from the landfill. So. I assume that there might be some of this, this kind of complaints, you know, and, and so, but I think, I mean, it is important to understand the situation in the context uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, I call it like the total disempowerment of Romani people in, in Slovakia, in fact. So there are many cases of violating the law uh, from the authorities on, on behalf of, of, of these people, and I mean, it's really, I mean, the negotiating position is su such a, I mean, low, you know, like that they cannot do anything. But in my opinion, 
Uh, and this is the reason why I also we, we, we prefer to anonymize or change the name of the town and locality for the paper, which is which is being drafted now, is that uh, this is the violation of, of law, in fact, because this uh, environmental impact assessment, I mean, report, I mean, even it stated that there is, uh, it breaks the, the norms, you know, that there are like uh, estates, like settlement, you know, in the, in the, in the very close proximity of the law. So it, normally, I mean, it shouldn't uh, be given permission to, to the, uh, to, 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 for the, for the, for the further uh, operation of the landfill. So, yeah. Thank you. Second question is for Sumitra. Okay. Uh, so actually, the main kind of discussion is about the ethnicity of the people in the districts. Um, first, I mentioned about uh, between the two groups, the relationships. Um, they live together without uh, conflicts in kind of convivial way. There is like, this literature on conviviality. Um, because they're like every day and they've been living together for probably six, seven years there. Um, uh, however, if you talk to each of the groups, they will tell you a lot of, uh, you know, kind of um, discriminatory remarks about the other, yeah, uh, unrespectable remarks about the other. Uh, you do get some intermarriage happening because, you know, young people go to the same schools, they, they know each other and so on. The Roma community has learned Turkish because it's a minority instead, so they communicate in Turkish as well. There is some intermarriage happening, which is always a problem for the families, but it does happen. So this is the uh, kind of um, situation with relations. Um, now, uh, I actually have a, a text in English also, uh, unpublished, about uh, how my own first entering these neighborhoods, I had to you know, come up with my own thinking of what's the truth about these people being Roma, and get used to you know their uh, their truth about being Turkish, uh, and I can send it to you because there is, they have a lot of different arguments about it, and also I discovered that for me, uh, more middle class and elite people were very convincing when they say we're Turkish. I have cousins which are somewhere in Adana because of some migrations from Bulgaria to Turkey in the 20th century. And it's, uh, it's really socially defined how like the poor or less educated, again, this is my own, you know, racial assemblage. It's really hard to perceive them as being Turkish and not, uh, you know, this kind of, we have this uh, academic notion in Bulgaria of uh, Turkish gypsies, actually an ethnologist have defined it. Um, but this community, the, the middle class and the elite, make very strong claim on being Turkish. Uh, and uh, it's true that there are other communities in Bulgaria where people would say, yes, we are Turkish gypsies. Uh, like, it, there is a quite a different uh, landscape of different groups. Um, but uh, this community is involved and such the region in trace uh, have a strong claim on being Turkish. I haven't gone in like historical time. My hypothesis, there was a mixture. So this is an old uh, local population, Muslim, left from the Ottoman times in Poldiv. It didn't move away like many other Turks did. So my hypothesis is basically the poorest uh, Turkish people remain in Poldiv and this division line, if we talk about, you know, like uh, Frederick Barks type of ethnic group uh, boundaries, this boundary between the Muslim uh, gypsies at the time and poor Turks uh, was not maintained anymore and they started mixing. So the, but that's just hypothesis, haven't been in the archives to see what's happening inside. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, before you wanted to say something before? No, no, no. I, I, I have. I, I think I came at the end. Uh, with the yes. Okay. Um. So, um, the question by Miriam to Nils Hu. Who's the next one? Hello. Thanks. Yeah. No, thanks for the question, and thanks for um your interest in the term, the concept of ecological citizenship. So there were a couple of points you raised, but the main thing you were interested in, I think, was the question of whether ecological citizenship is a privileged concept. And the main idea there, I guess, is the idea. Look. 
Um, do you have to be uh, well educated in order to use this? Do you have to be understanding of what your footprint is uh, in order to make use of this concept? Um, and, and also there's questions about who it affects. So I think you asked about whether it affects a, 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 a one per member of a household uh, versus another, maybe on gender or, or age grounds and that sort of thing. Um, so the good thing is that one of the powerful things I think about Dobson's concept is it doesn't require this kind of education or this kind of epistemic uh, standing. The issue here is that insofar as we are bound in material relationships that have environmental and ecological implications, that in and of itself generates these kinds of um, international community or cosmopolitan duties or relationships. Um, so I think that in that respect, it doesn't require um, any kind of epistemic privilege uh, in that in that way, but maybe you might think, well, it's important that someone knows that there are these kinds of relationships, and that I think is important for it to be actualized. You do need for someone to be aware that in this case, um, the scrap metal practices do reduce certain kinds of material flows, that they do reduce the um, footprints of others, um, and so that is something that is needed, but I, I think that that's maybe not quite as worrying as requiring that you have, say, a deep understanding of climate change or environmental processes in order to make use of this concept. So uh, just to sum up, the idea there is we think that this is an especially powerful um, concept because it isn't demanding epistemically, but also because it isn't demanding um, nationally or territorially. Um, but we do think that it sort of draws attention to the fact that there are these positive benefits um, to others of our environmental actions and in the context of the Roma of the of of the actions of of, of collecting scrap metal, um, and in that respect, we especially appreciate um, Alexios's uh, concrete example of of how this can happen in practice, which is something that's really interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for your your answer. I hope uh, your question was answered. And we have uh, still open the question from Alicante Space, or about Alicante's beautiful. I remember. <laughs> Uh, the time, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the discussing comments. They were very, very helpful. Uh, yeah. So I'm not going to go into detail. We don't have time, but makes a lot of sense. In terms of the energy poverty uh, definition, so uh, we actually went for a very basic thing because it, since it was when we were starting that, it wasn't focused on academia in any way. So we essentially looked at who has access to basic utilities like water, gas, and electricity. Uh, now, where when we are moving it into um, uh, kind of also the kind of academic realm and discussions, we uh, and then actually we were doing one more survey for a, for a project. Someone asked us to do this. Use one of these kind of more survey of using one of these more complex definitions to clarify the view of energy poverty. Often the, I mean, one of the first indicators is like the, what proportion of income you use, uh, and then it moves to the other ones, which is, I mean, how the indicators are like that. It, though in the context of like, David, for example, the, like what proportion of income you use for energy poverty, if you, uh, oh, sorry, for energy or utilities, if you don't have access to any utilities, it's kind of useless. Uh, so you, you, then you have to, uh, what we are actually working on for the, um, what's it called, the, one of the, because we now have a, we are moving towards like the definition of energy, some of the national one, but we don't, we lack the methodology for the collection. So what we are working on for the, uh, so like energy innovation and energy agency. So how, people who will be when they will be collecting data on energy poverty how they can kind of in, incorporate the context of marginalized uh, from Roma, community, Roma communities urban rural uh, because i mean it, it even when it, when it comes to things like energy audit you with this kind of buildings you can't really do the same measurements quite often you don't have some of the like you might have holes in the um, in the wall, so you you can't really do the same. Uh, you can't really use the same matrix 
as you do in a kind of a traditional measurements of energy. So you have to be quite creative. So you might have to kind of substitute this with a often more simplified indicators, I guess. But Helm one is, I think, a useful one, uh, though it's more of a kind of a, uh, this is because there is in most of the, and there might be actually some data uh, because there is, um, I mean, I'm just thinking in the context of Slovakia, there is a, a national program called Healthy Regions or Healthy Regions. So they have uh, their uh, field workers in, in there. So they might have some data available on the, on the situation, uh, but then, uh, that's why I'm, 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 for example, wouldn't feel competent which health indicator would be a good one. For that, I would we would need to call, we would aim to consult them or like a medical specialist. Because it's something as a social scientist, I don't feel uh, competent. I mean, this is kind of unexpected. My comment about like bringing in expertise from beyond our social science. I don't know uh, if it does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess uh, Diana. The floor needs to be given to you. Right? Yay! Um, thanks for having me again, um, because there was actually something I wanted to contribute to the question about the extent to which um, ecological citizenship is a very privileged concept, especially since um, Kim didn't have time to address the second objection that um, that uh, we, we had in the presentation, unfortunately, because, um, yeah, I think you're exactly um, you're, you're exactly spot on and that many times when we think about what makes um, recycling um, worthwhile it's always hipsters with tote bags and then when we see um, when we see poor people trying to make a living out of it then it's it, it gets stigmatized so obviously um, we have recycling norms that come into a context that's already or already racialized and um, structured along class lines um, and we wanted to bring some of that discussion in uh, by showing that the case of the Roma actually challenges a bit the concept of ecological um, citizenship because we do risk having second tier ecological citizens if we don't also address um, these uh, wider discrepancies within which um, uh, recycling norms as we understand them uh, come in. Um, and what it means for education, I think um, it's a very good point and it reminded me of a, a, a heartbreaking testimony from a child, I think he was Turkish, Turkish child living in Romania who was also uh, making a living of scrap metal and he said that one of the things he wishes was that uh, he, he wouldn't have to pick up scrap metal because his um, his hands gets very rough and he can't write well in school. And his his teachers um, would, would uh, deduct points for his handwriting, which was due to scrap metal collecting. So it's obviously a form of child labor. But the point is we have to recognize that it's labor first before we then uh, criminalize it. It's something that in uh, Caterina and Diego's paper, they also mentioned that um, scrap metal collecting is not even considered labor. So until you reach that stage, um, then you can't uh, even say the, the children who should be in school and are on the streets collecting scrap metal are, are actually performing child labor. So I think that ecological citizenship is um, in a way fit for this in-between stage that we want it to be where there's a lot of injustice that we need to address through it, but it's also um, seeped into um, wider um, hierarchies. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, we're glad it was thought provoking for you as well. Thank you, Diana. Um, any, anything else you would like to add at this point? Because soon, before we will be close, we have some more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have see. one more. Yes, sure. Uh, if, if Diana, you, you're finished. Um, no, just to say thank you so much for the comment on uh, Mary Douglas and and people out of place. Um, it um, I was I was hoping she would get mentioned today. Um, and thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. I decided to make my own little exhibition after seeing yesterday's. So I'm also doing like uh, with uh, my partner kind of small artist <laughs> projects in this neighborhood. So we have given like two comic books we produced together with. Uh, local people from the poorest, this informal housing area. You can see them over there in the break. Is there time for a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
Yes, uh, we have 10 minutes left, so we have definitely time for one more question. Online, there is also one person. We also have one. So we will take these both questions. Yeah. First, the one here in the room, and then the one online. And, and let me say that's great that you produced um, information in that kind of format, very creative and accessible. Um, so I didn't mean to deter with like, can I get one more question in from no, it's our, like, like, um, so uh, I was trying to formulate my question earlier. It's, it, I thank you all for these papers, um, really, really um, rich research. And um, I was thinking about more about the waste issue. So, and something that Alex had said about looking at, you know, what is the function of it all? And there's kind of an irony in there, in a way, if you think about the centrality of like neoliberalism, um, racial capitalism in the context of um, anti-Roma racism, um, you know, you would see that there's this uh, prominence of, you know, the market ideology, right? It's all about the, you know, the economy. Um, but when we look at these cases that you presented, we begin to see, wait a minute, it would appear that racism can trump the economy in these cases in many ways. And yet digging into the details, and I really appreciated Nicola's uh, um, presentation on that, um, that so on the one hand, we have an illegal free place to dump for those who don't wanna to pay to dump their stuff. They know they can go there, dump it, and they won't be held responsible or seen even um, doing so. And then, you know, in some cases, I know there's sort of the municipal of one's responsibility. So, you know, if the dump is on the outskirts of the city, well, we don't pick it up as often there. So it looks overflowing there because they're picking it up regularly within the city bounds, but on the margins where Roma tend to live, there's sort of less accountability, less responsibility. And then of course, the affirmation of, of a stereotype. Um, so we do see some economic benefit there. If we look on the other side, and this is a question that I that came for me in thinking about um, uh, Diana and Keon's paper about stereotypes, is that then um, I was thinking, so what is the sort of, you know, what's the what's the purpose of stereotyping? Why, why do people engage in stereotyping? And I, I can only think of like stigmatization in terms of Goffman, who said that, so the, you know, when stigmatization is occurring, one of his ideas is that it's to affirm the identity of the majority and their cohesiveness and inclusiveness, because you don't want to be excluded. You come together in this way such that you can't be stigmatized for that and you are a member of the majority or what have you. You are, according to Goffman, um, what he is is normal. Please pose the question. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. So I wanted to hear, so my question is, it, given all of this, um, you know, what are, your, what are your thoughts? Is it, you know, so economy, role of stigmatization, What's your, what are your emerging ideas about the functions of these waste dynamics, for example? To whom Thank do you, you pose the question? It was a bit complex to get to up whom to whom do you pose the question? To whoever would like to answer it. Uh, thank you. Does anybody want directly to react to this question? In one direction. Thank you. Um, just to add a little detail to your comment, um, it's not just because it happens rubbish to be in the periphery where Roma are. Actually, the authorities use the, you know, people who believe it's the Roma producing rubbish. That's why they can. Um, I would say, like, I wouldn't privilege one or the other. For me, we need to look at the articulation between neo neoliberalism and racism. And there will be another articulation between, let's say, uh, communist uh, state socialism and racism. So we need to study how these things work together. We cannot say one is productive, you know, neoliberalism is more productive than racism. So they, they work together in some specific combination, that's what we're going to study. 
Yes, thank you. Um, and before coming to the last question, maybe a reference uh, about the stereotypes. Everybody in this room maybe knows already her name. I propose to read Dr. Maria Bogdan's work on the position of the stranger, about the structure and construct of the so-called Seagoyna, a beautiful work examining very detailed uh, on the role of stereotypes in shaping reality, media, realities, and narratives. So I really propose everybody to read that work because it really goes quite deep on that topic about how stereotypes shape the role of different actors in society and how uh, majority society is able to segregate themselves by constructing the future of the Tsigoyana. So Dr. Maria Bogdan, if you would like to read that or go for it, uh, definitely I would read about that topic. And now, um, Last five minutes left, uh, our online question, please. Who was the person who wanted to ask yeah. something from Someone online? Raise the hand. Punita. Punita? She's here. Punita, can you hear us? You raised your hand to ask a question. We would like to give the floor to you now. Yeah, sorry, I was unable to unmute. But in the meantime, I think Diana and Kian sort of addressed what I wanted to ask anyway. It was about combating stereotypes with, uh, with countering stereotypes with positive PR in a sense. Uh, because I was wondering if beyond scrap metal, if Roma have become agents of, uh, of at the forefront of the recycling initiative, which is so trendy right now, um, you know, one could spin that and have it be uh, be a sort of um, a shield against stereotyping and i was just wondering if that's something that can be that can be promoted and taught to communities and leveraged so that um, the stereotypes can be mitigated and in fact maybe spun around into something more positive to whom does this question diana is, uh, diana yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for uh, the question, and I think it uh, it relates a little bit to the point about stigmatization that was uh, that was raised in uh, an earlier question, um, because we can almost see two ways in which um, we can improve or even resolve um, the negative stereotypes that we have about um, Roma waste pickers. Because on the one hand, if the majority population starts doing um, the same practices, then you won't have uh, this uh, uh, this um, pressure um, to, to stigmatize the, the Roma minority who is doing it because you, you lose the element of identity um, as the, the question about um, uh, Goffman was, um, was saying. You, you lose um, the identity of the majority population as someone who doesn't deal with their own garbage and who doesn't smell um, the, the smell of rotten food because now we have compost bags, for instance. Um, so th that's one way in which you, you can resolve um, this uh, stereotype. The other way, which would which would be um, what you know um, a, a better society would would allow us to do right now, would be to say that well, because garbage collecting is something that um, is of clear um, value, um, especially from the perspective of ecological citizenship, then we should be valuing uh, the practices as done by the Roma, even if they're not done by the majority population as well. Just on the strength of that um, contribution. Um, so I, I, I hadn't thought of this distinction before, that there are two ways um, forward. And I think the two questions um, bring, uh, bring this up. So um, maybe realistically, yes, the more the majority population also engages in uh, these recycling practices, the less stigmatization will be. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, in, in terms of perfect justice, that is the, um, the way we should uh, um, we should pursue because I, ideally we should just praise the contributions that the Roma are making on their own uh, terms. But um, yeah, as practically speaking, it's probably better to to, uh, to to follow what Punita was saying. Thank you very much for uh, Diana for this uh, answer. Thanks to everybody, our panelists. Thanks to everybody who attended online. Thanks to all the scholars, students, intellectuals, genius people sitting in this room. Uh, so uh, this is not over yet for those online and also those in this room. Now we have a coffee break and at 11.30, panel four will start towards environmental justice. My name is Gilda Nancy Horvath and I was very honored to be the chair of this panel. Uh, a nice day to everybody and uh, 
further thoughts and intellectual highlights, hopefully soon at 11.30 in this room. Thank you.